This is the second video in the Essential Extract of Complex Analysis series. In this video, I'm going to be talking about functions of a complex variable. The topics that I'm going to cover are definitions and notation related to working with functions of a complex variable, as well as a number of examples. The examples that I'm going to focus on are the exponential, logarithm, power, and trigonometric functions. First of all, when we talk about a function of a complex variable, we just mean a function whose domain is the set of complex numbers. Now, the functions that we're interested in general are also going to take complex values, and so the codomain is also going to be the set of complex numbers. So functions of a complex variable are just functions from C to C. Now, when you have such a function, you can think about what it does to a complex number of the form z equals x plus iy. When you plug a complex number z of that form into f, you're going to get out something which has a real and an imaginary part, and the real and imaginary part on the right-hand side here are going to be functions of the parameters x and y. In other words, if I call those real and imaginary parts u and v, then u and v are going to be functions from r2 to r. I might also refer to the function u as the real part of the function f, and to the function v as the imaginary part of the function f. Now I'd like to take some time to look at some important examples. For the first example, consider the function f that takes a complex number z and squares it. If we take a complex number z equals x plus iy and then square it, I leave it to you to check that what you get is x squared minus y squared plus i times 2xy. In other words, the real and imaginary parts of the function f in this example are given by u of xy equals x squared minus y squared, that's the real part, and imaginary part v of xy equals 2 times xy. It's also not a bad idea to think about what this function is doing in terms of polar coordinates. If the complex number that you're feeding into this function is given to you as r times e to the i theta, then of course when you square it you're going to get r squared times e to the i 2 theta. This is just a special case of the multiplication of complex numbers that I showed you in the previous video. Okay, before we go to the next example, I'd like to say something briefly about arguments of complex numbers. Let's suppose that you have a non-zero complex number z which is given to you in polar form as r times e to the i theta. Then, as I've mentioned before, the number theta is called an argument of z, and we might denote this by saying that theta is equal to arg of z. Notice here that I'm using a lowercase a. That's going to be important in just a moment. Now, you might have already noticed that an argument of z is not unique. If you take the angle theta and replace it by theta plus any integer multiple of 2 pi, you're going to get another number that's also an argument of z. Now, we're about to see examples where we're going to be defining functions, and we want to be able to pick a particular value of the argument so that our functions are well defined. In order to do that, it's useful to introduce what's referred to as the principal value of the argument. The principal value of the argument of a non-zero complex number is defined to be the unique angle in the interval from minus pi to pi, open on the left and close on the right, for which z is equal to r times e to the i theta. The notation for the principal value of the argument is also arg of z, but here we use a capital A. It's also true that once you've singled out one argument of z, that uniquely determines all of the possible choices of arguments. So for any non-zero complex number z, any argument of z that you can find is always going to be an element of the set principal value of the argument plus an integer multiple of 2 pi. Okay, now we're ready for the next example. In this example, I want to show you how to construct a continuous inverse function for a restriction of the function z squared that we saw in example 1a. Let's start by defining a function f by setting f of 0 equals 0, and for z not equal to 0, f of z equals modulus of z to the 1 half times e to the power i times the principal value of the argument of z divided by 2. The modulus of a non-zero complex number is a positive real number, and so when I say modulus of z to the one-half on the right-hand side here, I really mean the positive square root of this positive real number. You'll note that when I square the quantity on the right-hand side here, the modulus gets squared and the argument gets doubled, and so I end up landing right back on the complex number z that I started with. In other words, the recipe on the right-hand side is telling me how to find a square root of any non-zero complex number z. However, if I'm looking for a nice definition of a square root function for complex numbers, then there's an issue with this function, and the issue is that it's not continuous at points on the negative real axis. To see why this is true, think about what happens when you approach numbers negative r on the real axis through complex numbers that are coming from above and then from below. As you approach negative r through points z that are coming from above, the principal values of the argument are approaching pi, and so if you just use the recipe for the function f, the values of f of z are going to be approaching i times r to the one-half. On the other hand, as you approach negative r through points z that are coming from below, the principal value of the argument is approaching negative pi. And so the recipe for f, then, 
is sending those points to negative i times r to the 1 half. The issue here is really that the principal value of the argument has a discontinuity along the negative real axis. Even if you go back and try to redefine your function f using some different choice of arguments, you're always going to run into this problem that there's going to be at least one line that you have to throw out where the function is not continuous. So the best solution to the issue that we identified here is really just to restrict the domain. If we restrict the domain of the function that we originally defined here by throwing away the negative real axis and zero, then what we get is called the principal value of the square root. One quick comment here, one of the reasons for throwing out zero together with the negative real axis when we define the principal value of the square root is because we want the domains of our function to be open sets. That makes it easier to make the statements that we're going to make later. Here what we've done is we've defined what's called a continuous branch of the square root function for complex numbers. But it's important to realize that in doing so, we've made some choices. For an example of another way that we could define a branch of a square root on the same domain, we could take the function g, which is defined by taking the modulus of z to the 1 half times e to the i principal value of the argument over 2 plus pi. Now, it's an easy exercise to check that when you square this quantity, you do, in fact, get z. And it's also easy to check, just by factoring out the e to the i pi here, that this g of z is really the negative of what we called f of z above. Another thing to realize here is that there's nothing really special about the negative real axis. If for some reason the negative real axis was important to us, we could have thrown out a different line and then used a different definition of the argument here to define a continuous branch of the square root on that new domain. So we have a lot of choices here when we're trying to define a continuous branch of the square root function. There's actually one important topic that I'm not going to have time to talk about here, and that is Riemann surfaces. And Riemann surfaces are just basically ways of gluing together multiple copies of the complex plane. They're useful when you're dealing with inverse functions like this that are multiply valued because it gives you a way to try to talk about all the different possible values that could occur without making these arbitrary choices of branch cuts. Anyway, I'm not going to really need those for what I'm going to do later, so I'm going to go ahead and skip those just to save a little bit of time at this point. The next function that I'm going to talk about is another very important one. It's called the complex exponential. Now, there are a number of different ways of defining this function. You can define it using power series, which I think is a very good way. You can also define it as the solution to a certain differential equation. Uh, I'm going to define it in a very simplistic way, and I'm not going to worry too much about that because all the different definitions in the end end up being equivalent. So if you have a complex number z equals x plus i y, I'm going to define e to the z to be e to the x times e to the i y. I've already told you in the previous video that e to the i y is cosine y plus i times sine y. Then, as I mentioned, the function f from c to c defined by f of z equals e to the z is called the complex exponential function. Now, we want to spend a couple minutes here to try to understand what this function does to different regions in the complex plane. First of all, let's think about what the exponential function does to vertical lines in the complex plane. If you're at a point of the form x0 plus iy, when you apply the exponential function, you're going to land on a point of the form e to the power x0 times e to the iy. In other words, you're going to land on the circle of radius e to the x0 centered at the origin in the complex plane. Now, the y is just the argument of this complex number, and so as y increases from minus infinity to infinity, you're just going to go around and around this circle in the counterclockwise direction. Every time your y is an integer multiple of 2 pi, that means that the angle that you're making with the positive real axis is an integer multiple of 2 pi, and that means that you're landing right on the point e to the power x naught. It's important to realize from this that this function is not a one-to-one -one function. In fact, if you take any complex number z and you add an integer multiple of i times 2 pi, after you exponentiate both numbers, you're going to end up in the same place. Now let's think about what the exponential function does to horizontal lines. If you take a complex number of the form x plus i times y naught, where y naught is fixed, after you apply the exponential function, you're going to land on a point in the complex plane with argument y naught. Now, as x goes to infinity, you're going to go further and further out on that ray, and you're going to go to infinity. On the other hand, as x goes to minus infinity, the modulus of the complex number that you're landing on is going to be tending to zero. It's not ever actually going to get to zero, and that's the reason why I've omitted the point zero on the right-hand side here. Finally, I mentioned a second ago that the exponential function is not one-to-one. -one. Now, in a minute, we're going to want to try to define an inverse function, and so we want to try to ask ourselves at this point, what are the different ways that I could restrict the domain of this function in order to end up with a function that is one-to-one? -one? The issue with making this function one-to-one -one is what I mentioned just a second ago, that if you take any complex number and you add i times 2 pi, you get another complex number that maps to the same point when you apply the exponential map. Well, the solution to this is very simple. 
If you just restrict the domain of this function to be any horizontal strip of width 2 pi, including one of the boundaries but not the other, then you're going to end up with a domain on which the resulting function is one to one. I'm going to leave this for you to verify because I think it's a good exercise for you to make sure that you understand what this function is doing. Now I'm going to talk about one way to define an inverse function of the exponential function. Let's define log z with a capital L to be the natural logarithm of the modulus of z plus i times the principal value of the argument of z. Notice here that I'm using log of modulus of z on the right hand side to denote the natural logarithm of the real number modulus of z. Also, I've restricted the domain of this function to be the complex numbers minus the negative real axis together with zero. And there are a couple reasons for that. Number one, you can't plug in zero to the function on the right hand side because the natural logarithm function is not defined as zero. And number two, I want to end up with a continuous function. So for sort of the same reasons as we saw with the square root function, I'm going to have to make a cut somewhere and I'm going to cut out the negative real axis. The function log z defined in this way is called the principal value of the logarithm. It is an inverse function of the exponential function, but you have to be a little bit careful because it's an exponential function with the domain restricted in a particular way. To see what I mean, well, first of all, if you compute e to the power principal value of the logarithm of z for any z in the allowable domain, just using the recipes for the principal value of the logarithm in the exponential function, you're going to find that you do, in fact, get back z. And so there's no problems with that direction. However, if you try composing the functions in the other order, taking the principal value of the logarithm of the exponential of a complex number of the form x plus iy, when you use the recipes for the principal value of the logarithm in the exponential function, you end up getting x plus i times the principal value of the argument of e to the iy. And if you think about it, that's not equal to x plus iy in general because it depends on what y is. If you don't see that right away, here's a little example for you. If you take the complex number z equals 1 plus i times 2 pi, when you compute the principal value of the logarithm of e to the z, you end up getting 1 plus i times the principal value of the argument of e to the i 2 pi. But the thing is, the principal value of the argument of e to the power i 2 pi is not actually equal to 2 pi, it's equal to 0. And so you don't get z back out. The reason for this is easy to see, and it's because of what I told you before about the exponential function not being one-to-one. -one. The principal value of the logarithm turns out to be the inverse function that you get when you restrict the domain of the exponential function to the set of complex numbers whose imaginary parts are greater than negative pi and less than pi. Without this domain restriction, you could plug any number into the exponential function. But when you take the principal value of the logarithm of any complex number in its domain, you're always going to get out a complex number that lies inside this horizontal strip. Now, this domain restriction is somewhat arbitrary. And in fact, there are some problems where you might want to consider the set of all possible numbers that when you exponentiate them, you get z. So in order to capture that collection of numbers, we define a multi-valued function log z with a lowercase l. Here you're allowed to put in any non-zero number z, so any number in the codomain of the exponential function. And I'll leave it to you to verify that the collection of all possible numbers with the property that when you exponentiate them, you get z is equal to the set of all numbers of the form log of the modulus of z plus i times the principal value of the argument plus i times an integer multiple of 2 pi. Now, if you just combine the first two pieces of the puzzle here, you can see that this set of numbers is exactly the same as the set of numbers of the form principal value of the logarithm of z plus i times an integer multiple of 2 pi. The next collection of examples that I want to mention are power functions. So you already know how to take a complex number to an integer power, and we talked about how to take the square root of a complex number. Well, there's also a reasonable way of defining what it means to take any non-zero complex number to any complex power. And the way that we do that is just by defining z to the power alpha to be e to the power alpha times log z. Notice that this is actually the complex logarithm that we just defined, and so as I've written this, this is actually a multi-valued function. If you want to work out exactly what the set of values z to the alpha is, you can just use the definition that I showed you of the complex logarithm. After you substitute that definition in and then just rearrange things a little, you get that z to the alpha is the set of all numbers of the form modulus of z to the alpha times e to the i alpha principal value of the argument of z times e to the power i times 2 pi n alpha, where n runs through the integers. Now, you may be a little skeptical of this definition since knowing how to take modulus of z to the alpha seems to already require you to know how to take numbers to complex powers. Well, that turns out to be okay. I'm defining the modulus of z to the alpha alpha here to be 
e to the power alpha times the natural logarithm of the modulus of z, and all of that is well defined. Now, if you want to try to single out a particular value in this set, one that's pretty natural is to take the principal value of z to the alpha. The principal value of z to the alpha is what you get by taking n to be zero in the definition that I've given here, or equivalently, it's what you get by taking e to the power alpha times the principal value of the logarithm of z. Now, given those definitions, I've got a few fun sub-examples for you to think about here. First one is this. What if the power alpha is an integer? In that case, when you evaluate z to the alpha using the definition that I gave you, the n alpha part that I'm indicating here is actually an integer because the product of two integers is an integer. Well, when you factor that part out, you're gonna have e to the two pi i times an integer, which is just gonna be one. In other words, it doesn't matter what choice of n you make here, you're only gonna end up with the one value, modulus of z to the alpha times e to the i alpha principal value of the argument. This is just the principal value of z to the alpha in this case. So the point is that the function is single valued if alpha is an integer. That's good because it matches with our definition of multiplication of complex numbers. Next sub-example. What happens if alpha equals one over m for some positive integer m? In this case, following the definition of z to the alpha, you get the set of values that I've indicated here. Now, the crucial thing is to look at this piece, i times two pi n over m. As n runs through the set of all integers, it's not difficult to see that this n over m is gonna run through the set of all fractions with denominator m, and then it's just gonna repeat itself. In other words, you're just gonna end up with a set containing m values, as I've indicated here. Now, a little exercise for you, just to make sure that you're still understanding what's going on. Make sure that you can show that the analogous result is true if alpha equals a over m, where a is an integer, m is a natural number, and the greatest common divisor of a and m is equal to one. For the last sub-example under power functions, what happens if alpha is a real but irrational number? In this case, it's not difficult to show because alpha is irrational that the collection of numbers e to the two pi n alpha as n runs to the integers is an infinite subset of complex numbers. It follows that the set of numbers z to the alpha is actually an infinite set. A final exercise for you, maybe slightly more challenging than the one from the previous sub-example, is to show that the collection of values in this set is actually a dense subset of the circle of radius modulus z to the alpha centered at the origin in the complex plane. Okay, now the final collection of examples that I wanna look at in this video are the sine and cosine function. The question is, how do we extend the definitions of these functions that we learned in pre-calculus and calculus to make them nice functions of a complex variable? If you wanna to try to build this subject from the bottom up, probably one of the best ways of defining these functions is by using power series. However, since we haven't defined power series for complex numbers yet, I'm gonna to appeal to you to let me use Euler's formula for complex numbers. We know that e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. Actually, if we define these functions correctly, we can see that this formula holds for all complex numbers z. And this gives you an easy way of remembering how to extend the definitions of sine and cosine to the entire complex plane. It's pretty easy to see from the even and odd properties of the cosine and sine that e to the minus iz is actually the complex conjugate of e to the iz. That means that when we take e to the iz and we subtract e to the minus iz, we get two times i times the imaginary part, which is sine z. So if we divide out the two i, then we just get sine z. Now, similarly, if we just add e to the iz and e to the minus iz, we get two times the real part, so we get two times cosine z. And that means that cosine z is e to the iz plus e to the minus iz over two. This gives us a nice and natural way of extending the definitions of the sine and cosine to the entire complex plane. Well, that's the end of this video. Thank you for watching. In my next video, I'm gonna talk about analytic functions. If you'd like to get updates when I post new videos, please like and subscribe to my channel.